The Lord be with you. A reading from the Gospel of John. On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning when it was still dark and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not, did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed, for they did not yet understand the scriptures that Jesus would rise from the dead. The gospel inspired by God. I want you to imagine for a few moments that Helen Keller is still alive. She'd be a very, very old lady at this stage. But imagine that she's still alive. And imagine that she's a personal friend of yours. And this morning at some stage, you went around to her house and you invited her to come with you. You didn't tell her where she was coming to, but you said, I have a surprise for you. I want you to come with me this morning. We're going to a building and we're going to spend a few hours there and at the end of the two hours, I want you to describe to me what your experience was. And so Helen Keller comes in here. Now she's totally blind. She can't hear anything. And so she spends two hours with us here. And then you bring her back home and you say, well, how was it? Well, for one thing, she wouldn't have heard any of the music. She wouldn't have heard the readings. Bummer, she wouldn't have heard the homily. <laughs> And she wouldn't have heard any of the conversations that you guys have during the sign of peace. She wouldn't have seen the stained glass windows. She wouldn't have seen the lights. She wouldn't have seen the vaulted ceiling. She wouldn't have seen the Easter candle. She wouldn't have seen any of those things. So imagine what her description of her experience of spending two hours in this building would be like. It would be a fairly impoverished person in comparison to yours, you who can see and hear as well. Now, that's a little bit like the conundrum we have when we try to wrestle with the notion of reality. The human sensorium can literally see one seventy trillionth of the electromagnetic spectrum. If the electromagnetic spectrum were a line joining Los Angeles to uh, um, New York, 3,000 miles, the part that we can actually see, or sense, would be the diameter of a dime. And still we insist on making our maps of reality from this one seventy trillionth of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is how we create our sciences and our models of what we know. So I want to address that this morning briefly. And I'm going to make four main points this morning. The first question I'm going to ask myself is, how do you know that? And the second one is body language. Thirdly, who's in charge of the remote control? And then finally, what's reality anyway? So there's the four points I'll cover this morning briefly. So how do you know that? Originally, the only science, the first science, in fact, was philosophy. Philosophy was the way in which the first civilized people began to wrestle with the notion of the universe in which they found themselves. And so all of the sciences have come from, basically, philosophy. So at one stage, what we now call science was just part of philosophy. What we call the knowledge of the universe was a part of philosophy called cosmology. What we call uh, the science of reality was a part of, of philosophy that was called ontology. And the part that dealt with how we know what we know was called epistemology. And the part that dealt with you know, how the mind works was called psychology. But they were all parts of philosophy, all just branches of philosophy. But the branch that dealt with how do you know what you know is called epistemology. And I'm going to be very, very kind of crude and boil it down to just basic ingredients. And basically, there are three ways in which we know. The first way in which we know is that we hear it from 
an authority. Somebody or something that we trust tells us some information and we accept it because they're a, they're a teacher or they're a politician or they're talking on TV or they wrote something in a book. And so the first one is you accept something is true because some kind of authority figure told you it was so. The second way we know stuff is we figure stuff out for ourselves. So you come across um, a jigsaw puzzle in somebody's house and the picture is missing and let's say it's a fairly simple one, it's only a hundred pieces, but they're scattered around the table. And you have nothing to do for the next two hours, and you begin to try to figure out, I wonder, can I put these pieces together? And using the contours and the colors, you figure out how to assemble this jigsaw puzzle. So you figure it out for yourself. That's the second way we come to knowledge. And the third way is experiences that we have. So the three great strands of epistemology are, we hear it from an authority figure, we discover for it for ourselves, you know, or we have an experience, a spontaneous experience. Now, in response to that waves of knowing, we have five different mindsets. Imagine this is a dial here. This position is naivete. The naive person is the person who will accept anything you tell them. They won't even ask you questions. You tell them anything you want, and they'll believe it. The second position is a little bit further on. It's innocence. The innocent person will ask you some questions, but they'll be fairly simple questions. But basically, they'll accept what you tell them as the truth. The third position is the critical thinker. Somebody who wants evidence and data to support what you're saying is the truth. They have an open mind, but they want to see evidence for your position. And if the evidence is good, they'll accept your position. The fourth position is the skeptic. And the skeptic is basically somebody with a closed mind. They're not really open to new ideas. But if you bombard them with sufficient data, they'll finally accept, yes, what you're saying could be true. And the final position is the debunker. And the debunker is totally closed. The debunker is absolutely closed to any new ideas. And no matter how much evidence you give the debunker, they will not accept your position. A very, very famous scientist, debunker at one stage, speaking of psi phenomena, said, this is the kind of thing that even if it were true, I wouldn't believe it. Now, that's your ultimate debunker. So there are the kind of responses we make to the experiences we have or to the teachings we receive. Now, this is precisely the, the, the problem that the first disciples of Jesus had after the resurrection. They had these powerful experiences of a post-resurrected Jesus, but how are you going to convince somebody else, particularly the debunkers? And part of the problem is they're not authority figures. Who's going to believe a bunch of fishermen and carpenters when they start preaching about theological and philosophical issues. So they have no authority whatsoever. So how do you convince an audience that the experience that you've had, a really transformative experience, is actually real? And so they try a whole bunch of techniques. And biblical scholars speak about two kinds of techniques they employed. They're called the before-after images and the below-above images. So if I'm trying to convince you, Peter, that uh, the Jesus I met after his resurrection was the same guy you knew before he died, I'm going to have to you know, use him and say, well, um, he ate fish with us. You know, he's a real there was holes in his hands and we stuck our fingers into his hands. It was really the same guy. So I'm going to use the before-after images to impress upon you it really, really was the same guy before and after. But there's something very different as well. So I'm going to say, David, you know, it really was he, but there was something totally different about him. And you said, to me, can you prove that to me? Well, yeah, we're sitting inside in a room, and the doors are locked. We're afraid that we're going to get crucified ourselves. And all of a sudden, bingo, there he is. He's like, he, like, he materialized. And then when he was finished doing his shtick, he dematerialized, and he was gone. And Mary of Magdala would say, yeah, you know, when I met him after he'd risen from the dead, I didn't recognize him. I thought he was the gardener. And the two guys on the road to a mountain, he walked with us for several miles, and we discussed the scriptures, and we told him what happened to this guy called Jesus of Nazareth two days ago, you know, but we didn't recognize him until he broke bread with us. So they're going to use the before-after images. So you get two sets of images that form actually a cross. You get a before-after series of images and a below-above. So here you have the cross of resurrection, not just the, cr the cross of crucifixion. But the problem is, they're not authority figures. Who the hell is going to believe a bunch of fishermen when they tell you a weird story like that? So unless you had the experience yourself, it's not going to convince you. That's my first point. The second point then I want to talk about, I call it body language. 
And part of the problem with this is that, you know, we have a model of body in the West which is radically inadequate. We think that uh, the body consists of basically uh, a musculoskeletal system, an immune system, a cardiovascular system, a nervous system, an endocrine system. So it's just a bunch of physical stuff overlaid on each other. So basically there's only one kind of body. It's the physical apparatus, the WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Now, the Egyptians had a more sophisticated model of body. They had a two-part model. So there was the physicality of us, and then there was some kind of an energy template. One they called Ka, and the other Ba. So there's the physical dimension to us, and then there's the uh, energetic dimension which undergirds the physical. The Greeks were even more sophisticated. The Greeks had a three-party model. The words they used were Sarx, Soma, and Pneuma. So for the Greeks, the word sarx represented the physical body that the West thinks is the only body. But there was an energy body vibrating at a higher frequency that they called the soma. And then there was a body above that that they called pneuma, or the spirit body. Um, so there's the three-party model. But the Hindus did it best, in my opinion. The Hindus have a seven-tier model of body. So initially, there's the physical body made up of more molecules. You know, we've got about 70 trillion cells in our body. That's the physical body. It's vibrating before between infrared and ultraviolet, between 400 and 700 nanometers, so it can be sensed. But there, within that, there's an energy body vibrating at a higher frequency still. And this is the body that you, that you contact if you can see auras. If you can see an aura, what you're seeing actually is the energetic template of which the physical body is a hard copy or a printout. There's a third level of body that they call the astral body, and it's the body you inhabit when you dream at night. It's the place your emotions reside, and it's the archive of all of the experiences you have during a single incarnation. When you die, all of that information and experiences get downloaded to this astral body of yours. There's a fourth level they call uh, the mental body, and it's the equivalent of Plato's ideal realm. It's the place from which great ideas get downloaded, the places of inspiration for you. There's a fifth level of body they call the causal body. It's the place where you begin to access your psychic abilities, telepathy, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, claircognition, psychokinesis, um, precognition, these kinds of things. Then every one of us has a, that level of body. And that is the level, according to Hinduism, where you download all of the experiences of all your incarnations. And when you come back down again, you pick up all that information and it becomes part of your personality. There's a sixth level they call Atman, or individual soul. And then the seventh level is Brahmanic consciousness, or Christ consciousness, or cosmic consciousness. So it's a much, much more sophisticated model of body. Now the truth is, in order to understand Eucharist or resurrection, you have to be operating at least out of the Greek model and preferably out of the Hindu model. You cannot make sense of resurrection operating from the physical model of the West. Because it's not that Jesus Christ reassembled his molecular structure. That is not what's, what's happening here. It's that they were encountering the Christ figure at a different level of body, an astral, an astral level or a causal level or an Atman level. So in order to understand by, in order to understand resurrection or even Eucharist, you have to begin to understand levels of body. Now this is not just true of Christianity. Uh, there's a beautiful teaching in Tibetan Buddhism, a belief system that when really enlightened um, avatars have finished their life on planet Earth, they don't just die and disintegrate like the rest of us who just redistribute our molecular structure back into the ecosystem, but rather such a guru will sit down in meditation and transform and disappear and leave only what's called the rainbow body. So this is a Tibetan Buddhism belief system that the avatar will literally just dissolve into light. And people who are watching this performance will see literally just a rainbow effect. There may sometimes be, the clothes are left, obviously. Sometimes they say the hair and the teeth are left for some reason. Everything else is gone. Now, there's actually a scientific basis for this. Because the truth is, you've got about 70 trillion uh, cells in your body. Every, si every single cell in your body has about 10 to the power of 12 photons of light locked within it. So ultimately, you have about 10 to the power of 24 photons of light in a human body. So it is a scientific fact. If we knew how to do it, we can't do it yet, but it's a truth. If you could release all of the light in a single human body, 
you could light up a baseball stadium at one million watts for three and a half hours. That's how much actually light is within the uh, physical human body. So we're light beings in some sense of, of that word. And so we have to understand the notion of body when we talk about the notion of resurrection. Now we hear about, for instance, ghosts and apparitions. So was this a ghost they saw or an apparition that appeared to them? There's a distinction between ghost and apparition. Let me explain the difference to you. Every, this encounter here right now is sending out electromagnetic waves, audio and visual. So, you know, it's radiating out into the universe. So if you lived, let's say, on the sun, which is, it takes eight minutes from, for light to reach from the sun to us, or from us uh, to the sun. If you lived on the sun, and you were watching what's happening in this room right now, it would take you eight minutes before the first message got to you. If you were 10 light years out into the cosmos, it would take you 10 years before this information, this audio visual would reach you. But it's propagating throughout the entire universe. Everything that's happening anywhere in the universe is being propagated to the rest of the universe. So if you could travel out fast enough, way, way beyond the speed of light, you could watch an old I Love Lucy movie. It was just arriving at you right there and then. So everything that's happening is propagating these electromagnetic waves out there. Now, the difference between a ghost and an apparition then is this, in my opinion. A ghost is trapped energy, and an apparition is a trapped entity. So every single one of us, you're an entity and you have energy. So you exist at, these, at least these two levels. They, there's your being, your core, your essence, your isness, and then there's the energy that you disseminate or propagate. Now sometimes energy can get trapped. And when energy gets trapped, you have what are called ghosts. And the difference between a ghost and an apparition is you can't have an interaction with a ghost, but you can with an apparition. It's like if you're sitting at the banks of a river one day and you're watching the stream flowing and all of a sudden you notice there's a bunch of leaves that are caught in a little culvert, you know, a little eddy, and they're going round and round and round and round in circles. The rest of the river is flowing on, but these leaves are just going round and round and round in circles. So they're stuck in some kind of an eddy. Now that's what a ghost is like. A ghost is energy trapped in a physical location. It just keeps repeating on some kind of a cycle. Maybe once a day, once a week, once a month, once a year, <coughs> whatever. So if you encounter a ghost, the ghost does not encounter you. You're watching actually just trapped energy. You can't interact with it or have a conversation with it. But an apparition is different. An apparition is either a trapped entity or an entity that volitionally is present in a physical location. And you can interact with an apparition, where you can't with a ghost. So it's an entity, it's not just an energy form. So are we now talking about Jesus as some kind of a trapped entity, or some kind of an entity that voluntarily comes back into a physical location? So that's the, the importance of the body, the body piece. Go to my third point. Who's in charge of the remote control? I remember as a small child growing up in Ireland in the mid-40s and early 50s, you know, not, every, not every home in the village had a radio. There'd be maybe five or six homes in the village that possessed radios. And these were big, big, clunky affairs. I think only Kathleen is old enough to remember it. And then there'd be a huge, big battery beside it. And there was a dial on it. And basically in Ireland, we just had three stations. There were, we could get BBC, we could get Radio Luxembourg, and we could get Radio Aaron, which was the Irish station. And on Sundays, when there would be a big match and our local team would be playing and it would be broadcast on the radio, we'd all go into whatever house had the radio and were clustered around it. And we're listening. As you, these old radios were really, really crackly affairs and they would go off station very, very quickly and you'd be fiddling with the knob. And there'd be one guy who was the guru, the expert, who knew how to fiddle with the knobs. And everybody was shou shouting advice to him. No, you've gone too far. Go back. Go back. No, you didn't go far enough. And the station would come in and out, and in the middle of the match, at the kind of critical stage, it would go completely blank, and you have no idea who just scored. It's a really, really frustrating experience. And you're fiddling around with the dials like this. Now, that, in fact, is the sense of the, the Greek verb that's used when it says, Jesus Christ appeared to the disciples. It wasn't that it was a videotapable event. So if Jesus suddenly appeared right up here and stood in front of this lectern, and we're all looking in this direction, we're all going to see him. That's not the sense of the Greek verb. The Greek verb means, the one that's translated into English as he appeared to, means he chose to make himself visible to. So it's like Jesus was in charge of the remote control. 
He was deciding which radio he was going to broadcast on and which station. And if you were tuned into the wrong station, you didn't get to hear him. So, except this was a video. It's like every one of us has our little computer, and somehow Jesus is in charge of the master controls, and Jane can see him on her computer, on her computer but Lee can't see him on his computer. So Jesus is choosing to make himself visible. To him. That's the sense of the, of the verb. And so what allows some people to have this experience and others not? It is the ability to surf the states of consciousness. So I'm going to just point out two women, I'm going to call them two women of resurrection, who had that ability to shift their focus. And you may be thinking it's maybe Mary of Magdala and Mary the mother of Jesus, but it's not. One of them was Mother Teresa. And I have this extraordinary image of Mother Teresa going on a daily basis out onto the streets of Calcutta, meeting a snotty-nosed little urchin lying naked and hungry on the pavement and picking it up and seeing in this little child God and clasping it to her bosom, bringing it home, washing it, feeding it, and it dies anyway. And she goes out the next day and there's another little snotty-nosed urchin lying on the ground and all the others can see is this little waif on the ground. They have no interest in it whatsoever. She sees God there. And she picks up this little baby, brings it home, washes it, cleans it, and feeds it. And it probably dies anyway. Now that's resurrection. That's the vision of resurrection. We're both looking at the same thing. And one person is seeing a snotty-nosed urchin and the other person is seeing God. That's what it means to be in charge of the remote control. That is the mindset that allows resurrection to happen. It's a shift in consciousness that allows this experience to be really absolutely real. And the other person I want to mention is somebody whom some of you know. It's a very good friend of mine. She's uh, my own personal physician, and she's a naturopathic physician. She lives up in San Rafael. And her, her religion, her spirituality, is rescuing and looking after abandoned animals, particularly little kittens. So she'll go to the Marine Humane Society on a regular basis and they'll always assign her the really, really, really sick kitties. And she will treat them naturopathically and homeopathically. And I've seen on many occasions I've gone with her and there are these uh, disgusting looking little creatures, you know, prancing about in you know, four dirty paws, little kittens who are maybe two or three weeks old, and there's gunk coming out of their eyes and they're clotted, their fur is clotted, and they're flea infested. And her eyes light up like she's just seen the Son of God. And she'll catch him and hold him to her heart and crow him and kiss him on her head. And I turn it back and off and say, I hope the fleas aren't able to jump that far. <laughs> and then over the next four or five weeks, she'll, she'll drop or feed them with a little syringe five or six times during the night, you know, until these little creatures recover. And finally, after when they reach 800 uh, uh, grams, they're ready to be adopted out. If they could be adopted out, she let them go. If they can't be, she'll keep them herself. Now, this is a woman who would not describe herself as spiritual at all, but it's a woman with resurrection gaze. When she looks at a sick, dying animal, what she sees is a divine being. So that's what I mean by who's in charge of the remote control. What kind of shift in consciousness is happening in order, I just see a disgusting, you know, formatted, gunky little creature and she says, she sees you know, something that's worthy of being loved and cherished. My fourth point then is this. What is reality anyway? So most of us think, particularly if we're educated in Western scientific thought, that something is only real if it can be sensed through our sensorium or by extension through our instrumentation. Otherwise, it is not real. I've got a totally different definition of reality. For me, something is real if it can be sensed if it could be dreamt about, if it can be imagined, if it can be thought about, if it can be intuited. If I have any experience at any level, I'm dealing with a level of reality. Now, there are very many different levels of reality, and there are very many different dimensions to reality. Some dimensions of reality have physical extension, and therefore we can interact with them with our physical bodies. Some dimensions of reality exist only at an emotional dimension, you know, and we can't physically get a hold of them, but emotionally we can be in contact with them. Some of them are pure intellect, and the only way you can wrestle with them is at an intellectual level. Some of them are deeply mystical, and the only way we can interact with them is by having some kind of a mystical experience. So I've used this model with you before. I want you to imagine that you see this uh, circular cylindrical skyscraper. So it's a towering building, many, many, many stories high. 
and uh, there's um, a corridor goes right up through the middle of this system, um, a bank of uh, elevators, and you can climb onto these and it'll bring you to any floor. And if you get off on any floor, you find yourself in a circular corridor with rooms opening up. And each room is kind of pie-shaped. There's an outer curved wall, and there's an inner curved wall, which is the door that you went into. And let's say there's just eight of those on a floor. And each floor represents um, a stage of consciousness, and every room represents a state of consciousness. So let's say there's just eight states of consciousness. A lot more than that, but just say let's, let's say there's eight. So there's your waking consciousness, there's your dreaming consciousness, there's your sleeping consciousness, there's hypnagogic consciousness through hypnosis, there's meditative state of consciousness, there's mystical, divi mystical divine states of consciousness, mystical natural states of consciousness out in nature, and formless mystical states of consciousness. So there's at least eight states of consciousness that you can go through on a regular basis. And then there are stages as you elevate and you do your, do your work, your spiritual work. Now imagine you go into this elevator bank and um, instead of going to the first floor, you realize there's a corridor outside you and you go into the first room off the corridor. And in the back wall, you see a mural painted, but it's just black and white stick figures. And you, you say, wow, they're fascinating. Wow, this is an interesting mural. And you're seeing this mural and now you think you've understood reality. Your only experience of life has been a single room on a single floor a single state of consciousness in a single stage of consciousness. And you come out and you become a cartographer of reality. You become a Western scientist and you start describing the universe, having only seen one room on one floor where there were black and white stick figures. Had you had the courage to come back out of that room and go to the next room, even on the same level, you would have found that there are other parts of the mural painted on the other walls. And in order to see the entirety of the mural, you needed to visit every single one of the rooms on that floor. Now, they're all black and white stick figures, but ultimately, you now get the impression it's a much more complex mural than I first estimated. So anybody who has the ability to visit these other states of consciousness and become a cartographer of reality, drawing on the experiences from those other sta sta states of consciousness, you have a much finer map of what reality consists of. But most of us never visit those other rooms. And certainly, there are very, very few people who have the courage to get onto the elevator and go up to the first floor. Because if you do that, you find a similar arrangement. There's a circular corridor, and there are eight rooms opening off the corridor. And you go into the first one, and this one is a mural as well. But it's, in, it's painted realistically in black and white. And so you go in here, and now you see the mural. Wow, it's really coming alive. You know, it's a realism at this stage. And you go around to the next room, and you begin to realize, oh, wow, it's just part of this extraordinary mural. And having visited all eight rooms on the first floor, you now have a much greater appreciation of the mural that you thought you understood on the first floor. But it gets better and better. You go up to the next floor, and it's a mural realistically painted in color. And now you've got an appreciation of reality, which is a way, way beyond the guy who was stuck you know, on, on the ground level in one room. But you can keep going and going and going and going and going. And you reach levels where um, the mural is a hologram. And you reach a level where the mural is not just a hologram, it is an interactive hologram. You can actually interact with this. And it's all the ways up, it's as far as you choose to go. Now, most of us are stuck in a single room on the ground floor, and we're making our maps of reality from that one place. This is what resurrection is about. Resurrection is about the ability and the courage to get on that elevator, to move through the states of consciousness and the stages of consciousness in order to interact with reality, which is multi-dimensional. And this is the importance of imagination. I've defined imagination for you before. Imagination is not the ability that allows us to fantasize about stuff that's not real. Imagination is the ability to volitionally change my state of consciousness and access dimensions and have interactions and encounters with entities that reside in those other dimensions, dialogue with them, learn from them, and bring that learning back into this state of consciousness and cross-fertilize it with my map of reality. And this is the real meaning of resurrection for the people of Jesus' time. There's a big difference, as I've explained many times, between, between facts and truth. Something can be factual, but not true. 
and something can be true, but not factual. Because fact, facts are to truth as knowledge is to wisdom. Facts are to truth as the intellect is to the soul. Facts are just data points about the physical level of reality. That's all they are. They're not particularly important. Uh, wisdom is very, very different. Truth, I define as follows. Something is true if it transforms me and aligns me with God. And something is ultimate truth if it transforms me radically and aligns me permanently with God. So something can be true but not factual. It may not make any sense at a physical level, but it is a, a radically transformative experience. And this was the great you know, uh, meaning of post-resurrection appearances of Jesus to his disciples. These were people who were cowards hidden away in a locked room these were bumbling fishermen who couldn't put two sentences together and now they're willing to give their lives for this experience they just had. And they become these extraordinary, eloquent preachers of the truth because the experience has been so powerful. And for most of them, the real experiences came in their Eucharistic encounters. That this Jesus character became so real in their Eucharistic encounters that they were radically changed, or aligned permanently with a different, a different kind of truth. And that ultimately is the only way to encounter resurrection. If you attempt to explain resurrection uh, at a physical level only in one little room on the ground floor, you're impoverishing the meaning of the Christ event.